host, non-intended host, um, they can survive and sometimes cause infection in non-intended hosts. So um, in the literature, it's been proven that um, frogs and geckos and chameleons, um, we are, we produced a paper last year testing like hokey frogs and greenhouse frogs and cane toads um, all had um, DNA. We have to follow that up with infectious stage larva. Um, and yes, if an animal ingests those, um, and humans or dogs or birds, then that third stage larva um, could carry on and potentially cause disease. Uh, prawns have been identified as um, being a host, a non-intended host. And then over here, last year we also produced a paper about rat lungworm in water. And so if a slug or snail dies, um, once the body starts to decompose, the worms come out of the body and are able to live freely in water. Um, and in our lab, it's for at least three weeks. Um, and so then, you know, what happens, the question is the life cycle, what happens to um, those larvae? Um, we have some other studies that we've been running that to find that they are pretty sensitive to desiccation. But in the event that they don't dry out, um, are they going to infect, um, you know, potentially other hosts through water? Uh, this is tadpoles and other frogs and what happens if other people eat those. And then really interestingly, um, which was something that was known sort of, a lot of people knew and it's well known in the literature that snails and slugs are carnivorous upon each other. But David Modry um, from Czech Republic also um, produced results to show that um, infection can occur and you can cross infect um, a slug and snail just from being carnivorous. So if a slug is infected with a you know, L3 larva, then, and it feeds off of, um, excuse me, if a slug or snail is not infected and it feeds off of a slug or snail that is infected, then the infection can spread. Um, and so he actually proposed that carnivorous slugs and infection is spreading probably mostly through this carnivore action, and maybe even more importantly than between um, rats and slugs and snails. And so that was also really interesting, which kind of affects um, how you know, people might wanna think about doing slug and snail control on their property. Um, and we have talked a lot about, you know, just because you kill the slug or snail does not mean that you kill the parasite inside. So be really careful, we haven't, had a chance to test a lot of the slug baits and other uh, things out there, mechanisms that people are using. So just be really cautious of a dead um, carcass. Um, so we have a great complex life cycle, um, but for the most part, human cases um, have mostly been attributed in the literature towards um, ingesting or consumption of uh, slug or snail. Um, there are a lot of cryptic cases out there where we're not entirely sure where infection is coming from, um, but for the most part a lot of people globally attribute infection to slugs and snails. So it would make sense to then overlay what is the infection um, that we see in humans with slug and snail data. And in theory you should see some sort of a correlation if that was the primary means by people getting infected that um, in areas with higher human infection, you would see higher slug or snail infection, um, either prevalence, the number of slugs and snails infected, or the loads and how many parasites they have. Um, and so much to our benefit, the um, Hawaii Department of Health has published uh, their data um, in 2019. They um, they published this map and across the islands. And you can see the case. So you've got um, most of the island chain really, they divided this up by zip code. And so most of the island chain has very few cases. This, these light grays are in the one to five over, and this is over the time period, 10 year time period from 2007 to 2017. Um, but here you can see on the big island, the Hilo zip code, the Keao zip code, and then the Pune zip code um, all have an increased um, occurrence of human infection. And so with uh, Pune being the highest. And then they took their data and what they did, so when they mapped these human cases, 
um, if there was a known site of infection to say, okay, I know I got um, exposed in this, you know, in this district, then they, then they track that um, address with the patient to say they were infected here. But if there is no known um, infection, source of infection, then they just use the um, person's residence, their home residence. Um, and so, like for example, um, most recently there was a case on Kauai that she had actually traveled to the Big Island um, and gotten infected uh, on the Big Island. So they track that to the Big Island rather than tracking it to Kauai. Um, but what's interesting is that they broke down, they used the um, ArcGIS uh, hotspot analysis software, and they, they were able to um, further break down human infection. Um, and this is by census block group. And they found that the Hilo uh, district and then the lower Pune district are both uh, considered hotspots for human infection. Um, what is really interesting, I happen to live in the Kao district, which seems to have in their zip code map the same occurrence as Hilo, uh, but it's not considered a hotspot. And my guess would be because the lots in the Kao district are like one to two acre sized lots um, versus the Hilo and lower Pune districts have much smaller subdivisions, so there's a higher population density. Um, it would be really interesting to see uh, this data reanalyzed under um, number of cases per 100,000 you know, population size or something like that. Um, so that's kind of an overview of, of human case infection. And then slug and snail infection, one of the biggest studies done to date, what came from Rob Cowie's lab on Oahu, um, his student, um, they published two papers. There's the Kim et al, 2014 and 2018, they had 1,271 specimens from across the island chains. That was 37 species, 182 sites that were collected over an eight year time period. Um, and so I took their data, they um, published their data and did a supplemental database where they included all the uh, GPS locations of all the samples they took. And I looked at that based on zip code and then overlaid um, their results of infection status with um, zip code. And here you don't see any trends whatsoever um, on Kauai or the Big Island um, to map. Do you guys see this uh, box of my maps? I keep dragging it around. Um, right now we see the um, Big Island and Kauai map. Okay. Okay, I just have this little box with all the videos from everyone, and I have to keep moving it so I can see my slides. So, um, but it's great that you don't see that. Um, so, minimize us. Oh, oh yeah. Hey, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we have here um, Kauai and the Big Island, and there's nothing that really stands out as correlating with human infection loads. Um, and one of the reasons that we are comparing Kauai and the Big Island is that the Kim et al. papers found that the number of sites on both islands was that were infected was relatively the same. I think it was like 33 and 34 sites um, had infection in them. Um, and they have fairly similar habitats. They're relatively um, heavily forested, um, lower population sizes, so less urban areas to some extent. Um, they both have a lot of rainfall. But then um, what's really interesting is that Kauai does not have the semi-slug. And the semi-slug has been identified as one of the most um, potential uh, intermediate hosts that are of concern, of the highest concern that will be causing um, human infections, and infection. And it's been identified over and over and over again in the literature, even though um, there's really no data to prove or tie the semi-slug to human infection. And one of the interesting things about the Cowie data set 
is that they really only sampled 12 semi-slugs of the 1,271 specimens that they did. So they had a pretty small sampling of that, um, which might be affecting their data. Um, but when you look at this, yes, you will see a lot in the news um, that any slug or snail species can carry um, rat lungworm, and that is true. But when you look at the prevalence across species, clearly P. martensi has um, a much higher chance and probability that if you come across a P. martensi slug, the odds that it's infected are much higher than in any other species. Um, and so it definitely is cause for concern to, we need to look at this semi-slug in much more detail. So the semi-slug arrived to Hawaii. It's from Southeast Asia. It arrived to Hawaii on Oahu in 1996. And on the Big Island, even though it was officially documented in 2004, there are reports as early as 1999. Um, and Robbie Hollingsworth did a great, um, study in 2007. He put an ad out in the paper and asked people um, if they had seen this species and to let him know and he discussed um, a lot of the really disturbing behavior around this species which is very different from other slugs and snails. Um, and so this guy is a climber. He loves um, a home and human dwellings and so you find him all up over um, on top of people's homes, in their gutters, on the walls of their house, up the lanai, some houses that are on um, slab, the slugs will actually climb and go right into the home. I've personally found them in my car. They're definitely all over your garden and your you know, recycle bins are up in your trees. Um, they're just kind of all over the place, um, which makes their behavior um, an extra concern for, because it really brings them into contact with humans. Um, and so um, the semi-slug, the other, sorry, one of the other problems with the semi-slugs is that the sizes range, you can see over here, um, this is a baby semi-slug on a nickel. So it can range from the size of a grain of rice um, to about, I think about five and a half grams is about the biggest I've seen. Um, and which can be just about the size of your, of your index finger. Um, they can get really large. Um, and so there can be, um, it can be really hard to miss when you're washing uh, produce. Um, so in Hawaii, when he did his study, the semi-slug was primarily found in um, Eastern Hawaii Island in the Puna district. Um, and there was an isolated population over in Kona and Keao. Um, but for the most part, everything was in East Y. And the, in 2017, um, the semi-slug was identified in Maui in the Hana district. Okay, so um, we happen to have, um, at the time, before I came on board with Sue's lab, they wanted, they knew that the semi-slug was migrating out of the Pune district. So they started collecting, because Robbie Hollingsworth had collected a whole bunch of um, semi-slugs and the Cuban slugs, Veronicella cubensis, um, they were doing the same. And so they sort of just opportunistically collected the semi-slug and the Cuban slug in the Pune district and the Hilo district to try and document the spread of these species and the spread of infection um, into the Hilo district and potentially up the Hamakua coast. Um, and so there's about 352 specimens um, of these two species from 18 sites across um, the Hilo district and the um, Puna Keao and Puna district. Um, and then in 2017, we got a huge um, set of data of samples, 170 specimens from um, Kauai, from our CTAR partner, Kathleen Fielder, um, that was uh, on Kauai at the time. And those were also haphazardly collected. Um, and it's a variety of uh, different species, seven species from 13 sites. Um, and so if we take our data and look at it similarly to the way that we look at Kauai's data, um, with the Kauai infection in the slugs, we see something very similar to um, Kauai's data where you don't really see um, any trends that correlate to human infection. 
now I there's like huge flaring red flags on, on this statement is that I understand that correlation does not is not causation and then also um, neither of our samples or neither of our studies um, Cowie study or uh, you know what we collected were designed for this purpose so we didn't know that the Hawaii Department of Health was going to publish their data and we didn't know how they would analyze it or how um, they would you know do it or when they would do it and it just kind of happened that this paper came out and we said hey what can we do now that we have more information on human infection how can we look at that and how can we use that um, and so yeah our sample sizes are all over the place um, the sites are kind of all over the place it's not necessarily a, a great representation of the entire zip code area um, and so it would be great to get some more detail on human infection um, and really map that more with slug and snail infection. Um, but the interesting part, despite some of these limitations um, and, and um, you know, experimental design issues that we've got, um, when you look at our slug and snail data from the Big Island and you're looking at our 352 specimens of um, the semi-slug and the Cuban slug, you start to see something that is a little bit more in line with human infection. Um, and for the most part, P. martensi is driving a lot of this because we found 84% infected of P. martensi and 35% infection in the Cuban slugs. Um, when you break that down into these areas, so our sites, our Hilo sites actually were in this Hilo hotspot district. Um, and there's 62% infection of P. martensi. Um, that was 29 samples. And the parasite load had a mean of nine and a median of zero um, L3 um, per milligram of tissue. Um, and we take the tail tissue. Um, there was a, a previous study that Sue did that found um, the parasites to be primarily concentrated in the tail of the semi-slug. Um, in the Kiao district of 31 samples, um, we saw 90% infection with a mean parasite load of 17 larvae and a median parasite load of two uh, larvae. And then the lower Pune district, 87% infection with 150 samples. It's a pretty good sample size. Um, and, and parasite load is going up, um, mean of 25, median of nine. Um, and then in the Mountain View area, we had um, only three samples, uh, but both the mean and medians um, came out as a zero L3. So we detected the DNA, it was definitely had DNA there. It was just below, the amount of DNA that was there is below our detection capabilities um, to be able to calculate how many. So we have a, a number of standards and that it came up as positive, it's just well outside our standards for, for our assay that we have. Um, and what's really interesting, if you look at parasite load by zip code uh, in more detail, the mean and medians are really not good ways to represent the data because a lot gets washed out and there's so much variability. So if you just do scatter plots of um, your infection status and the parasite load. So this is mean quantity per number of L3 larvae per milligram of tissue. Um, clearly you can see that the lower Pune district has a lot more slugs with a lot higher infection um, number of larvae in them. Um, the Mountain View area, oh sorry, thank you for choosing. Okay, sorry, I got a, some sort of notice. Um, okay, the Mountain View area came back as, um, yes, they are infected, but that had, it was too low to really calculate. The Kao area um, had a lot more uh, infection um, and number of parasites in the slugs. And then interesting, the Hilo area was actually pretty low. Um, and it really kind of begs the question of why are human cases so high and I would suspect that they're potentially getting some of their produce um, or agriculture from the Pune district because it's such a big ag area that maybe some of these high infected uh, slugs and snails are making it into uh, the Gila district um, through produce because of all of our farmers, which I hate to say that because I love our farmers and I love local produce, um, but it is a little bit of a concern. 
Um, and interestingly, so this is a semi-slug, and I mentioned that even just like these Mountain View uh, data points were below our lowest standard, so kind of outside our uh, capabilities to detect and quantify how many larvae are in them. Um, similarly, the Cuban slugs, all of our Cuban slugs from East Hawaii Island um, also had very low, um, we call them for QPCR, we call them a CT, it's a cycle threshold. Um, excuse me, they had very high cycle thresholds, um, which means that it's kind of outside our capabilities for uh, determining the lows. Um, well, I'm too slow. Okay, I set a timer so I speed along. Um, and then Kauai, all but three of our samples on Kauai were also below our lowest standard for detection. Um, and so even though we can't tell and calculate how many larvae per milligram of tissue, um, Clearly, they're much lower than the P. martensi samples that we're getting in that are within our standards and that we are able to calculate a parasite load. Um, so there's a huge difference that's there. Uh, if we take a look at P. martensi in some other ways, um, if you look at uh, prevalence, so this is just how many, the numbers of slug that are infected um, per slug mass. Um, now we don't have a whole bunch of the really small uh, slugs um, below, um, like baby slugs, we don't have a whole bunch in that sample size. Um, but you don't see any particular trend. So here you're not saying, oh, you can't really say, oh, a small slug is more likely to not be infected. That's not the case. Um, or a big slug is more likely to be infected. That's not the case. Um, and we, over here we graphed, um, this is a scatter plot of the quantity of larva. Um, by our slug masses. And so you also don't see any obvious trends to say um, slugs with smaller masses um, have lower infection levels than slugs with higher masses. We don't really see any trends like that either. So um, in East Hawaii, you're just as likely to get um, exposed to a high dose of the parasite from a small slug, as, a small semi slug, as you would a large semi slug. Um, if we take a look, um, the Hawaii Department of Health data for the Johnston paper said that most human cases occur January to April. So we wanted to see, you know, what does that look like for um, our slug and snail data. And again, big red flag, this wasn't collected and designed to look at seasonality. So our sites vary throughout the year, the numbers of samples vary throughout the year. But regardless, whether you're looking at prevalence and, and how many um, slugs or snails are infected. You don't see any obvious trends throughout the year. Um, and similarly here when you're looking at parasite loads, our highest parasite load was actually in June. Um, so if you come across a slug and snail, um, you're just as likely to get one that has a high parasite load in June as you would as December. Um, one of the big things that our data set is missing that we think is really playing a role in this is, you know, during the hot, dry months, you're less, we believe you're less likely to come across a semi-slug. We think that they're, because it's hot and dry, that they tend to go into cool, wet, moist areas. Um, in East Y, my guess is that they're going underground into lava tubes and underground um, various niches that are there because there's not much soil. There's a lot of, you know, um, loose rocks and habitat for them underground. Um, so that's what I'm suspecting. So that is um, a little bit um, missing in this in this story. Um, and so I mentioned before that correlation is not causation, but in the literature there are a number of um, outbreaks, human outbreaks, that have been attributed to semi-slug population booms. So in Okinawa in 2004, uh, you've got the semi-slug um, became prevalent in the 2000s, and then all of a sudden they saw a seven-case outbreak in January of 2000. Um, Hawaii, the semi-slug was first documented in 2004 when people really started uh, to notice it and, um, and document it. And so um, you start to see over here, this is uh, Hotchberg, uh, 2007 paper that analyzed Department of Health data to find um, the Big Island, Hawaii Island, to have a population boom um, from November 2004 to February 2005. Uh, North Kohala, there um, is a gentleman that gave our keynote 
one of our keynote talks at the conference, um, he lives up in the hubby area and his farm, he found a, a big population boom. Um, and then he found some on his um, salad and he was one of a, a very severe case of rat lungworm. Um, Maui, um, we're not entirely sure here. There's a, um, a spike in human cases in the 2004-2005 range. We're not entirely sure what caused that. Um, the semi-slug arrived in 2017, but you did see a human case boom um, in 2017 with the Maui cases. Um, and what's really kind of stumping me and I'm really interested in is Oahu. I know people on East Hawaii say, oh, once Oahu gets it, um, then they'll start to care and they'll put more money at it and it will be, you know, things will be better for us because, you know, it's just they don't think it's a problem or whatever. But Oahu actually had the highest number of cases. So you can see this table down below. You know, they had 15 cases from 1959 to 1965 and then 11 cases from 2001 to 2004. And then it just dropped off a cliff and you only get a case in 2010 and that was it for this data set. Um, and so why did human cases drastically reduce? The semi-slug arrived in 1996. You don't hear about it in East Hawaii. Everybody knows the backpack slug or the semi-slug because it's crawling all over your houses. I mean, we literally at the College of Pharmacy, we can go out on a rainy night and when we need larvae to work for experiments, we just pluck them off the walls of the College of Pharmacy because they're just everywhere. They're just everywhere. Um, and so you don't get that on Oahu. And why, why don't they? What happened? What's different about East Hawaii and Oahu? Um, and why don't we see that? And so I'm interested in that story. Um, and then certainly, um, you know, for pest management, you guys are all in the invasive species world, which is great. Um, and you're doing great work. Uh, because this causes a really serious neurological disease, um, we ask that this species in particular be a high target for you um, to monitor and look for and possibly eradicate in areas um, if it, you see it spread. Um, Rob Cowie, um, in his paper, he listed it as a major pest with USA um, quarantine significance um, for export produce. Um, we'd really like to protect right now. Um, there's no reports that the semi slug is on Kauai, Molokai, or Lanai. And so we'd really like your help to try and um, make sure, you know, if you guys are connected with the communities out there, um, let's try and make sure that we can protect these islands. Um, that would be really great. California Department of Food and Agriculture has intercepted the semi slug 37 <laughs> times from 2009 He's to 2016. What's that? Anyways, okay, sorry. Um, so uh, Hawaii Department of Ag, or excuse me, California Department of Food and Ag, um, it's on their radar for high risk um, pest and they've got dog teams. It's reported on nursery stocks and plant parts um, that are imported from Hawaii. Um, and they, we are working with the California Vector Control and we've given them all of our methods um, for testing rat lungworm and rats, slugs and snails. They have some isolated populations of koki frogs um, over there. Um, and I, I'm not sure if they're gonna be looking at other things like centipedes or things like that too. Um, but really we need a big comprehensive statewide monitoring program of the semi-slug because we really just don't have a bunch of information about this species in particular. Um, we'd love to get some citizen science involved. Kathleen Howe's been doing great things with the schools. Uh, school garden programs. I think Franny Brewer has also um, been working a lot with um, schools and education and, the, and their school garden programs, which has been great to pass the tor torch and get some this help with that. Thank you, thank you. Um, QPCR, so to determine infection loads, we tend to do QPCR, which is um, a lot more cumbersome for cost and equipment and time and personnel and all that, trained experienced personnel. But we're trying to develop this recombinous recombinase polymerase assay, RPA, which is sort of like a pregnancy test kit that maybe we could get, um, you know, people to do either in the field or, um, you know, citizen science kind of people to help with monitoring. 
Um, and so I'd like to ask for your help. I've established this email, semislug at hawaii.edu. Um, that's going to go directly to me, and I'd like to start um, you know, developing collaborations with people across the state to try and help figure out you know, exactly where is the semi-slug now and track anywhere it might be going. We don't necessarily know um, its elevation limits or you know, rainfall limits. If it's really, there's reports that it's over in Kona. We're not entirely sure. We haven't tracked everything quite yet. Um, so definitely ge geographic distribution, uh, trying to keep it off Kauai, Molokai, Lanai, uh, Maui, any out areas outside of the Hana district. Um, on Oahu, the semi slug is on Oahu. Um, Rob Cowie, I need to get some more information from him, um, but we need to exactly figure out where it is and monitor um, for the rest of the state, because I, I think it's just fascinating why it's so different on Oahu than it is here. Um, and then um, abundance data of this species. So that's a big thing that's also missing is that, you know, I go out and do slug and snail control on my own property and I can tell a huge difference throughout the year um, or with the rain, um, you know, if you come out in your yard between rain showers, you know, they all come out, you can easily um, pluck them for a slug jug or whatever. Um, but then also to get some more information about these huge population booms and there's just a lot of reports from people that they just say wow i never saw this slug before and then all of a sudden there was just hundreds everywhere where did they come from how did they get here how do i get rid of them kind of thing um and infection prevalence load so if you start to help and you um, find the semi-slug in areas that we don't know that it exists if you could collect some samples and put one slug in one Ziploc bag, label it with the date and GPS like location that you found it and just throw it in the freezer, then we can arrange to have um, samples uh, shipped over to us so that we can start um, you know, a new study with trying to track you know, what's happening over time. And we'd be happy to be collaborators with that. Um, and then any unusual behavior. So, over here, there are reports um, of these huge population booms, especially when the semi-slug enters an area. Um, there are reports of large underground clusters um, in plant root balls. Um, people are really concerned about well water and county aquifers. I have no reason to suspect that they go that deep, but I don't really know. Um, there's a lot of um, anecdotal reports from people that um, when they're um, digging with backhoes or things that they'll just come across huge masses of them underground. Um, we also, other slugs and snails can repel from um, ceilings, so they'll crawl up onto the ceilings and then repel down with their slime and use their slime sort of like a rope. So we'd like to document that further. Um, so if you have any evidence and documenting of, of the semi-slug, especially doing that, um, we'd love to document that further. So um, anyways, with that, we've had a lot of great collaborators and we hope to have new ones if you guys want to join the fight while well, some of you already are, but um, yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions.